Check, check. Hey, everybody. Welcome back after lunch. How's everyone doing? I hope wide awake. <laughs> um, look, today, welcome. Um, my name is Ben, and in this talk, I'm going to be going through um, my entire journey, kind of from beginning, uh, before I had a startup, all the way through to kind of where we're at today. And I want to cover a lot of like the lessons I've learned, kind of explain how I've done this, uh, you know, journey, I guess, and uh, really dive into kind of uh, all the hurdles you might come across uh, and if anyone is interesting. Actually, this is a really good point. Who here is thinking about, you know, I'd like to go try some business like this. I'd like to go do a startup at some point. Yeah, I hope. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, uh, fantastic, because I think it, it's, it's a wild ride. It's, it's like a, a different path through life almost is the way I'd kind of describe it. Um, and I think it's, it can be well worth doing. And kind of what I want to do by the end of today is like equip everyone with like a little bit of a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of uh, an armory to say, hey, look, if I do want to go do this, I at least know slightly more than Ben did when he tried and really struggled to do it. So that is the, uh, the goal from today. Um, and what I'm going to do is kind of give you um, a bit of context first. So we're going to start with kind of where I'm at today. Um, and that's both from a uh, company size and revenue kind of standpoint um, and kind of what type of business I run. So it can give you a bit of context as to what we do. Um, but not only from like a company perspective, but also from a personal perspective because everyone's journey is going to be kind of different. And so it's good to know kind of my background, my life context, where I was at the time, where I am now kind of thing. Um, so we're going to start here. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the whole five-year journey. So I'm going to be looking at kind of what I've done, what you can do in the, like, the early days before you've started, uh, you know, wanting to go out in this kind of journey, um, taking a look at, you know, what experiences you might want to have, how do you go find an idea, you know, what is it you actually want to go do, um, how do you take the first step, you know, what does that look like, going from safe, comfortable, full-time role to unsafe, uncomfortable, unfull-time role, well, probably full-time, but uh, the startup journey, effectively. <laughs> And then kind of like early days uh, in your journey, what does that look like? Take a look at building a product. Um, what early execution and gathering feedback looks like from like a software perspective, like building a company. Um, and also importantly, kind of dealing with your, your own feelings and your own emotions and that kind of stuff because it is a wild ride. And so there's a few tips and tricks um, I can share with you about that. And finally, what does it look like when we you know, have a product together? What does it look like when we've got something and we want to you know, take it to the next level? So we're looking at a little bit of marketing and growth and taking a little bit uh, of a look at attracting investment, if that's the road you want to go down. Um, I have done that now. And yeah, that's a whole deal too. So I do want to talk about that. Um, and I want to start today by kind of getting two of like the key learnings right out of the way, right at the beginning. So if you don't take anything else away, this is something to take a look at here. And it's that everyone's journey is going to be different. Um, for me, where I was, what I did, life events, everything like that, um, this is kind of just an explanation of my path and how I got to where I am. Uh, it's going to be completely different for everyone here. Um, and so whilst you're listening to a few of the, you know, some of the advice I give and that kind of thing, really take it into context for yourself to say, look, uh, does this apply to me? Does it not? Or, you know, maybe I have other avenues that I can go down. Um, but the one thing that is kind of really common is uh, the fact that it's all about people at the end of the day. Uh, for the most part, in my experience, every significant step, uh, every significant push forward or growth of the business has really come down to the fact that we either met someone new, we uh, worked with someone new, uh, or, or we had uh, built up a network or relationships with people. Um, and so... Yeah, I kind of do always fall back to this. Like, mostly, it's not about products, it's not about anything else, it's about people. So, let's take a look at the company as it stands now. Um, to give you a quick hint, it doesn't really matter what we do specifically, but to give you a quick idea, um, we're a payments automation company. So, if you're a business that issues invoices, we collect everyone's credit cards, and then when we see an invoice is due, we'll automatically pay that invoice uh, on behalf of that customer and settle the money to the business. Pretty simple, it's just online accounting payments. Um, that's what we do. Now, oh, one thing that I'm happy finally about now is that I've given this talk kind of over the stages of how I've gone. 
Um, and now I'm not embarrassed to show the revenue figures, so you'll actually see real dollars, real figures of everything going through our business. Hopefully that helps with context, uh, but we'll see how we go. I'm super excited about where I'm up to, so I hope you are as well. Um, so right now we're at about 160K Australian per month, um, which is great, I'm really happy with that. I have done one um, round of investment. We've actually just finished the second one, but I have done one round, it was 720K back in May 2020. So kind of, as things were going down, we were uh, yeah, trying to go up. So uh, I'm really happy with that. Uh, and we've just hired our fifth employee. So that's kind of the scale of where our business is at and what we're doing. And to give you some real world figures, whoop, there we go. This is pretty much the trajectory of, of where we've come from and where we're at now. Um, so I'm recording back here till you can see it's about uh, late 2018. Um, the last time I gave this talk was kind of in the middle there, um, right before we kind of had a bit of a boost upwards. And ever since then, funnily enough, that's when we raised money. So go figure. But um, uh, that's kind of the trajectory uh, since. The main thing I want to get across with this slide, if, if it's not obvious, is that it takes a really long time to do anything. Uh, like it can take quite a while to gain some steam and some traction and that kind of stuff. So uh, it's not really about a case of weeks or months. It really is a case of years. And so keep that in mind when you're kind of looking at where we're at and what we've done. It's taken a long time. Now this one is also I'm really happy to show. Um, so the, the uh, left is the um, gross profit, I believe, in this graph. So it's the blue line. Uh, and then the orange is our total overheads, or everything we're spending. Um, and that little spot there, where we are now, that's profitability. And I'm super happy, because we finally hit profitability this year. Um, it just means that we're earning more than we spend. So like as a, as a gauge, that's kind of like a really great outcome, really great end goal. Um, if we weren't looking to grow and take on more money and more expenses, then as you can see, more expenses are coming. So uh, I'm now going to lose profitability again. But this is a fantastic achievement, I'm super proud. And so this is like one kind of end goal for, uh, for a lot of people as well. It's like once you reach this point, you can kind of continue on. You can gradually improve your product, but you're like kind of, you've hit this safety line, if that makes sense. So um, I was just, I'm proud. I just wanted to show that off. So. Okay, so that's a little bit about kind of the company and where we're at there. Now I just want to give you a quick kind of overview about myself and kind of uh, what I've done and where I've been. Uh, at Twitter, Ben Who Likes Beer, by the way, if anyone um, would like to follow me and keep up to date with kind of what I'm doing. Um, I was a full-time .NET developer for four years, um, left uni and went straight into a job uh, at a company, ironically, that does a remarkably similar thing to what I'm doing now. So uh, built up a little bit of uh, experience there. Um, I did end up moving to being a .NET consultant with uh, SSW, which you might see out in, the, uh, out in the foyer there, for four years or so. And now I've been doing this startup thing for five years. So it's actually it's the thing I've been doing the longest now, uh, which is nice. So uh, I'm happy with that. But that gives you a little bit of an idea of kind of like background and, and where I've been. Um, and if you'd like to come and talk to me, I've got three handy uh, categories that we can get off the ball with. I love payments, I love web development, and I like beer. Specifically, I like brewing beer as well. I've got a whole YouTube channel on that. So uh, if you're uh, interested in that, uh, if you find me, it's called Mash Hacks. Um, anyway, that's a quick aside. So um, one of the things I wanted to talk about uh, in terms of like life perspective is if you wanted to go out and build a company, uh, the question that's often asked is like, when's the right time? Or what do I need to have done before I can go you know, out on my own like this? And the way I like to think about it is that there's kind of, there's maybe like three things that you really, um, you want to do. I think one of them is learn the basics. So if you are at school, at uni, uh, still learning um, what's going on, I would try and go get a full-time job for a while first. It's, it's nice to have learnt from mentors and people who have been in the industry and all that kind of stuff. And just building down the basics of like your own craft, um, getting good at one of the you know infinite possibilities there are in IT and web development or any development in that case. 
Um, and I remember back a little while ago, um, while I was at my first full-time job, I had a friend of mine who was my now co-founder. And he always used to say, hey, why don't you like, go out and do some freelancing or something like that? Like, why don't you just go earn some better money you know, out in the world? And I was always really scared, I think. Uh, I didn't know how to do that. I was like, oh no, if I quit, how do you find clients? Like, how do you, how do you get people to pay you? Um, and so I remember having this real big hesitancy to, to go out into the world. So I wanted to stay at my kind of job. And it wasn't until a little while, this is kind of the four year mark of me being uh, a full-time .NET dev, that I managed to go to a .NET user group. I talked to a few of the guys at SSW and I was uh, you know, interested in trying something new. Uh, and they suggested, hey, come have an interview. I ended up going and getting that job, which was fantastic. And that kind of pushed me out into the world um, and I learned a completely separate set of skills um, that I was learning as at my full-time dev job. And so I think the um, thing I would kind of get here is I reckon there's actually a lot of benefits to consulting specifically as a role uh, at a point in time in your career. It's not for everyone, um, but a couple of the things I do want to point out is that um, you learn to sell yourself. It's a little bit different than selling a product because you know it's a service. People just have to want the service and trust that you can do it. So selling yourself isn't, I think, as difficult, but it's still selling. Um, you need to learn to manage relationships as well. So uh, you know, you'll be working with clients. If they're unhappy, you've got to navigate that. If, you know, uh, it, they're, they're, you're working with people, basically, and you're the person giving the service. So you, you, you do have to work around them. Um, it teaches you a bit about responsibility and accountability. I can distinctly remember as a, a, a developer um, walking out the door, uh, five, five o'clock, CEO's office, walking out the door, the CEO goes, hey, Ben, have you deployed that thing uh, that we need? It's like a payment form for a customer. And I went, yep, no worries, champ. And then I strolled straight out the door, only for it to have broken overnight, that customer to get really upset, and then for me to sheepishly walk in the door the next morning, trying to hide from the CEO, basically. And he's like, come here. So uh, I got in trouble for that. But the, the, the difference here is that as a dev, I didn't really care per se. I was pretty young as well, but like, I didn't really care per se, like kind of what the business effects were of what was going on. I just wanted to make sure the software worked and the software was nice and it was, you know, it did what it, what it wanted to do. Uh, and so it does teach you a little bit about, yeah, taking on responsibility for what you provide and, you know, uh, maintaining it and working with the customer. Uh, and lastly, and I think probably most importantly, actually, is thinking about business needs over development needs. And this is really coming down to just like, do you have the budget and the capability to make a very robust project and how big do you make it and that kind of thing. Uh, and instead of being like, no, best practice as a dev is to do X, Y, Z, we cannot build without making sure it's perfect versus, oh, we need a product. It's just a test. It's a prototype. We don't know if the market's going to like this, so let's build just something and get it out the door, test it, see how it goes. And then maybe further iterations, we might improve it, but it's thinking about, yeah, how will this sell? Do we have enough money to make it? That kind of thing. Um, and really, all of this boils down to three key, I guess, traits or like skills that you'd want to build up, and that's just sales, communication, and business. Foundational aspects of starting a company, uh, in my opinion. You've got to be able to do these things. And I think consulting just happened to be this brilliant way of gaining those experiences without having to start a business per se. So when I come to think of it as well, the, the next stage or the next thing I would recommend to people is building up some domain knowledge in an industry, be it whatever, um, but one of the key things, because we learned the basics, it's the domain knowledge one. Um, one of the key opportunities when you're like looking for an idea, and we'll kind of touch on this a little later, but it's way easier to expand and improve on ideas in the existing domains you already know. Like I'm, I've been in payments a while, I can kind of see opportunities floating around uh, in the peripheries. Um, so if you've built up skills in, you know, if you're writing software for like mining companies, you might notice that maintenance schedules are perhaps a little dodgy and there's an opportunity there. Um, or if you're in, you know, government even, 
you might notice where there are some inefficiencies or something like that. And you can build products that are based on what you've already learned rather than just being like, oh, you know, I wonder, I wonder if bakeries would, would enjoy this piece of software that I've written. You know, it's, it's easier to find opportunity. Um, so I highly suggest building up some, some sort of domain knowledge anyway, because it, it should help. Um, and then try consulting. Uh, I did it, it, again, it's not for everyone, but I, I kind of really recommend um, giving it a crack. So, next, we're kind of, we're at the, the point where we think we've got enough experience, we think we're, we're, we're considering, you know, thinking of building something. Uh, what do you build? Now, if you're anything like me, um, especially earlier on in my career, I always, and it's kind of cut off there, um, but I always was kind of churning out little things and trying to find something that might work and building little products but uh, I never really stuck with anything. And, and one of the important things, I guess, or the important contrast between this and where I am now is I haven't done anything but the thing I'm working on now. Like every, <laughs> every idea I have, and I'm like, oh, that'd make a cool thing. I'm like, nope, get that out of my brain. I've got, <laughs> I've got work to do. So I haven't done any actual side projects since. Um, but one of the side projects I did do kind of earlier on, again, through kind of domain knowledge -y stuff, is a thing called Sky Collect, um, and it's kind of like a real basic version of the thing I'm doing now. It kind of just emailed an SMS to people and said, hey, go pay something, go pay your invoice, please. And it had a little payment page, and that was it. Um, and that was a cool idea and all, and it kind of worked, but it was, uh, it was really, hard to, really hard to sell. I really struggled to get anyone to actually use it. And so I even went to a... Um, uh, get some advice from like a, an angel investor kind of thing because I was like, oh, you know, how do I how do I get this product off the ground? Um, and it was while talking to them that they suggested, oh, you know, what's the what's the addressable market? You know, how many people are out there wanting this? And you know, are you charging correctly and all that kind of stuff? And we just had no idea about any of that stuff. So at that point, we kind of talked about, well, we used to work at a business that kind of did this payments-y stuff, but it did it in this other way. Um, and he was like, well, have you thought about doing you know, more something closely along those lines? And we were sitting there going, uh, 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 maybe, maybe we could do that. Maybe we could figure that out. Um, and so what I ended up doing was you know, taking a couple of years to think about it. But what I want you to guys to do is kind of have a think about are there any ideas related somewhat to any of the work you've already done where you reckon you could improve something? So have a think, have a think to see if you can pick out any business ideas of your own um, and just hold on to that thought for a little bit. Because what we're going to do is we're going to critically analyze the ideas we had um, and take a look at some of the things you should be thinking about when you've gone, oh yes, definitely, I want to make Software for bakeries. It's, it's locked in. I, don't, I know exactly what I want. So first of all, let's think about the business model. There's a few different ways that you can um, kind of spin up a business or different business models that you can have. Um, subscription access, $50 a month, whatever it might be, is very popular. Most SaaS products are like that. Very tried and true method. Um, you can do one-off payments. So like a well, like this one is dietitian report. It's where someone will come to your software, they'll fill out some information, you'll use your smarts, generate a one-time product, it's just a report, and it says, here you go, here's a report for your current health, $100, please. That's a one-off payment. So that's an idea of a model right there. Um, you can sell data, and it doesn't have to be the dodgy selling of data. Um, if you are providing a free service of some kind, uh, and you do just want to aggregate, um, information about you know, your service under the hood uh, without actually giving away any kind of personally identifiable information. Totally legitimate way of doing things. Haven't seen it very often, to be honest, but totally legit. Uh, and lastly, a pay-as-you-go system. And this is kind of what we did. We take transaction fees based on the payments going through our system. So we take a little clip of the ticket off the top, um, which <laughs> is both a fantastic model when you are big, but a terrible model when you are small because you need a lot of customers to get off the ground and get anywhere with that kind of thing. And funnily enough, um, it sucked. And for a few years, I always used to say it sucked. I wish I did SaaS. 
and now that I'm kind of attaining a bit of volume, now I go, oh, thank God I did do SaaS and we've got volume because we can just keep putting people in the system and it'll keep growing. So, you know, your preference for business model might change over time as well. So it's something to think about. So think, think about the industry as well um, that you're getting into. I think, um, yeah, a couple of good things. Having a passion for it, I think is kind of important, not critical, but you're gonna be doing this thing for a long time. Um, so if you don't like the thing you've started, you're gonna be stuck with it for a long time. So uh, it's a good idea to enjoy what, what it is you're building. Um, when I say have good access, what I'm talking about here is like, can you reach your customers? Um, do you have the ability to get to them? So if I wanted to serve bakeries, I guess I could walk into the bakeries, but if I wanted to serve US VCs, uh, I'd have to go to the US and make sure I could actually get meetings with people and make sure I can actually talk to them. Uh, so make sure you do have access to the customers you want to sell to, um, and preferably both. Yeah, if you've got both, that really helps. Um, next, you want to think about your competition. So competition isn't super critical, I guess. You're never really truly competing or well, very rarely are you really truly competing with other businesses. Most people are just running their own race and you happen to be successful uh, or not. Um, but a kind of shortcut is to say, is the business model validated? So have other businesses successfully done what you wanna go out and do? Because if they have, then you at least know it works. If you're coming up with a completely different way of doing things, that can be really challenging. It can, it can be done, but it can be very challenging. And so for a first go, I probably wouldn't do that. I'd try and find a model that already works. Um, another thing is like, yeah, what's your point of difference? Uh, this will probably be the first thing you're asked if you're ever compared to another product, which I am constantly. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of Stripe before, but I, uh, side note, Back in the day, before Stripe was in Australia, wanted to build Stripe for Australia, ended up building it, Stripe came to Australia. That was a whole, uh, a whole rough deal. But um, when I was selling our product as just a payments gateway, first time, what do you do? Why are you different? Um, and so we ended up having accounting things in there, but uh, it's, that's the first question people are gonna ask you. So make sure you do have a point of difference. Um, and do you have uh, sufficient resources? And this one, I like to, think about like a sieve map, right? I'm kind of, I wanna get up here. That looks like a pretty rad mountain. I wanna go there. But I'm down here hanging out with the elves in the forest. And so I wanna to get to there, but there's a bunch of army and stuff in the way. I'm just one person. I don't really have the ability to get that far. So I shouldn't shoot for that you know, mountain. I, may, I should maybe shoot for one of these mountains down here instead and go, oh yeah, look, I can make base camp here, maybe mine some resources, and then build up a big enough army myself to then make it to that mountain. And the reason I think this is kind of interesting too is because I was also super naive in getting started, especially with this volume-based business model where you need lots of customers. You need a lot of time and effort and money to get that kind of stuff off the ground, which I didn't have. And so keep in mind, yes, you could build, you, you know it's a problem in the industry, you know it's a good piece of software, you know that it is gonna help customers, but do you physically have the sales resources or the dev resources, especially these days, to build out exactly what's needed? So think about resourcing and whether or not you can actually physically make it to your destination. So we have some experience. We have a business idea. We've kind of looked at how it might work, whether or not we can probably do it. How do you take the first step from, okay, I'm comfortable in my job and I now want to go build a piece of software? Well, for me, I had my major life event, I guess, in a sense, is that my wife and I moved to Belgium, we were down the street at the bottom there. Um, uh, it's uh, in Leuven, in Belgium. and. We had, uh, well, she had a good enough job such that we could survive off her salary. I didn't have to work. We were pretty young, 26, and Belgium's cost of living was less than Australia, much less than Australia's. And so there was this opportunity for kind of, yeah, we, we, I could do a thing. I could have a crack at something. Um, and we kind of agreed that we weren't really gonna save anything we're gonna go travel, we're just gonna enjoy that kind of life stage that we had. 
um, and I was going to have a crack at just building a product. I didn't really think about the whole startup landscape or the future or anything like that, really. Like a lot of naivety came, was part of these decisions. Um, but I thought I could have a crack. And so it was at about this time that my co-founder and I uh, met up in a pub in Sheffield. And um, we came back to that angel investor's advice to say, hey, that really successful business you guys used to work for, if you can build that and give it a twist, you know, why don't you just go do that? And so it was in this pub that we sat down and we started sketching out kind of the code. And we're both developers. So of course, we spent a year building something before even trying to sell it. But that's a whole other deal. Um, and so we decided, yeah, let's, let's give this a crack. And so what I did is I didn't just do this all in one hit, but I think I'll get to that. I think what, what I would talk about first is giving yourself time. And, and mostly it's giving yourself time to experiment. Um, it's in Belgium, part time for a little while, part time on, on the business. Um, but I had a lot of time to think and really think through the architecture of the product, really think through developing everything. And when you're given time to experiment, and I want you to kind of, con maybe, maybe you've experienced this yourselves without even knowing, but I want you to kind of compare building something where you've got unlimited time or just a lot of time to do it versus there's a feature that really needs to get out the door and there's time pressure and money pressure and lots of like, go, go, go. And if you've either never built a thing like that before, maybe it's a little bit of a new piece of architecture or it's a, a different product that you haven't done before, um, you may or may not just come back to like safety. So you might go, oh, I've done something like this before, but I'm not going to look at the other solutions to this. Maybe you've done, maybe it's authentic authentication. And you're like, I've done this way of authenticating before. I don't want to look at what's out there. I just, I'm just going to replicate this, bang, bang, bang. Whereas if you've got the time to sit there and go, right, what is out there? How could I build this? What could it look like? Um, then you may find you come up with a better solution it may have taken longer. It may not be the best decision from a business point of view, but I really think that taking the time, even just normal day-to-day -day dev work or day-to-day -day consulting, taking just a bit of time to play with things, um, yeah, helps you experience new things, helps you find new solutions, and I really just highly recommend it. If, you, if you've just been doing the grind, like just task lists coming through your backlog, um, and you have the ability, try taking a little bit of time out, doing some Fun Friday stuff. So. Um, so I was in Belgium, and I was experimenting. Um, I, I did Identity Server, by the way, in case anyone's uh, wondering what it is I was experimenting with. That ended up being a really core piece of our product, and it was a really nice you know, catalyst for building the rest of it. Um, but I'm in Belgium. I'm working kind of part-time. I've got half-time consulting gig, half-time on the product. Eventually, I start going full-time on the product, um, mainly just not saving any money, in fact, kind of eating down on savings as well um, while we're over in the low cost of living country. But then we moved back to Australia. And this is after about, it's about a year and a half of building the product and only about a year since trading. We started trading in mid-2017. So I spent a whole year building it before I started trading. But we came back to Australia and I ended up, um, Basically, the cost of living is a lot higher here. And I ended up with a, a wife who was saying, look, what's the go here? You need to start making some money or you need to start doing something differently. And so I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I was not working any other job. Um, but what I did do is when I got back to Australia, uh, having spent all that time learning Identity Server, I ended up doing a little user group talk on Identity Server and just had this little example. And I got a couple of consulting gigs out of that as well which is a fantastic little bump in uh, kind of savings. Uh, so I spent maybe a couple months doing that kind of work. Um, and so that's a little tidbit. You can uh, go out and do a little bit of uh, coding for food if you need to. Um, I, I think especially if you take the time to experiment and find some sort of topic uh, that people will be interested in, that, that's a really good way of doing it. Um, but yeah, I ended up not getting paid properly for three years. It wasn't until, and by, by properly I mean like at all, um, from my own company for three years. And had I had known that at the beginning, I might have you know, changed uh, 
whether or not I did it, but uh, I managed to persevere. So there are gonna be many roads to how you might be able to take this step. Uh, my co-founder, for example, was doing a lot of consulting. Like he was just doing freelance work, but he did a lot of freelance work and he only kind of worked part-time on the business, um, mostly where he could. So he took on additional hours and he kind of sustained himself through consulting. So whereas I kind of plowed all in and just kind of ate away at a bit of savings, so there's a few different ways of going about it. Um, probably one of the harder things is to just go and do it, but I can highly rend, recommend just going and doing it if possible. Um, and luckily, when I say just do it, it's not just go start a business. It's go take one of the first steps, you know, go do something towards doing it. Um, and there's a few of the just do these that you can do right now. In fact, you have done right now. Attending a conference, this is fantastic. It's a great way to learn a new topic. It's a great way to like see what's out there, see what you could maybe learn about and maybe consult for if that's something you want to do. Um, but yeah, write some blog posts, get, you know, get, gain some, um, some network connections that way. Uh, make a video, I, I like making videos, so I always put that as a suggestion, but you know, there's a bunch of stuff you can do. Put on your own events is really great as well. Just become known in a community, and I think that can really help. But there are other ways that we can also get towards starting a company, uh, and it's not by starting a company at all. It's about building up a little bit of passive revenue so that you can um, eat away at that instead. There's a, a really great podcast I listen to called Startups for the Rest of Us. Has anyone heard of that before? No? Nope? Well, okay, step one. Go download and listen to a few episodes of Startups for the Rest of Us. It's great because it's just a podcast about non-VC startup style stuff, like where you just, you just build good things you can take on a modest amount of, um, uh, what do you call it, investment. Um, but great podcast, highly recommend. He, the, the bloke that runs it's called Rob Walling. He's got a thing called the stair step approach. And this is fantastic. And this is a bit more of do as I say, not as I do, because I didn't do any of this. But I really love the idea. Um, start out with a one-time sale product. And his example is a WordPress plugin, right? So build something that's useful, get it out there into a channel that's kind of automatic, so the WordPress marketplace, you know, people will come to you, you don't really have to go out and sell it. Um, and if you can make a little bit of money there, fantastic, that's step one of the stair step approach. Keep doing that until you can buy back a little bit of your time. So make another plugin, make a course, make a little mobile app, something where, you know, with a mobile app, you've got the Apple App Store, people will find you there. If you write a book, you'll have to sell that a bit more. Uh, if you write a course, you'll have to sell that a bit more, but it's all these things you can do to build up revenue. Uh, and then you can go and try a SaaS product. So I highly recommend it. Take a look at Rob Walling's website. It's the stair step approach. Okay, we're ready to build. We've got our product. We have taken the first step. We know we're comfortable with a few years of taking the time to build something. Let's go build it. Now for me, I ended up uh, again as a developer just plowing straight ahead and building something instead of going out and asking you know, customers, hey, by the way, what do you want? <laughs> Rather, I, I thought I knew best, I guess is the point here. I was kind of looking at existing businesses in the industry. They were too big. I was copying very large businesses. Um, and I was, yeah, basically going, I know from my experience, I know best. I'm gonna go build this thing that I know people want. Um, and, <laughs> Once, once I went, this is a payments API. Once we built that um, payments API, I went, right, how do I test this? How do I get people to sign up? I know, I build a second product. And that second product can talk to that first one. And this second product was the accounting integration side of things, so the invoicing side. And so the purpose of the invoicing side was just to send payments to the first one. But what ended up happening is there were people in the accounting and bookkeeping industry who really loved the accounting side of things. And so they're like, how much does that cost? And I'm like, yes, it does cost money. <laughs> and so we ended up selling that product uh, to the accounting industry, and it was making a little bit of money on the transactions as well. But that was kind of the key focus. And so I guess <laughs> one of the approaches you can use here is kind of a, a, in retrospect kind of discovery is that you can um, just send cold emails out asking for opinions on uh, you know, their thoughts on the industry. For us, we had this little accounting integration. We're like, hey, uh, does this work for you? Are you interested in this kind of thing? And a lot of people responded, especially if you asked for opinions. So it's like, hey, we've built a thing. We'd love to get your, your opinion on like, whether or not 
it's useful, whether or not you'd like this kind of stuff. Um, and so, yeah, we, we basically just sent out about a bunch of cold emails, but we did get a bunch of people sign up. Um, uh, yeah, so this one kind of ties into those two products. So the, uh, I built the API engine and my co-founder built the, the accounting product. And we always had this dichotomy of, I wanted to build things super correct and, and built well, because he just wanted to get something out the door. Uh, and I guess over the five years now, I would say the, the happy balance is somewhere in the middle. I would still argue it's still a little closer to doing it properly, but you know, he, he also would argue the opposite. Um, so I think be flexible in what you're building. Um, do get it into customers' hands as quick as possible. I think that's one of the key takeaways as well. Get feedback. Don't be afraid to ship something crap get some feedback and then make it better and then get more feedback and then make it better again. Um, I think that is one of the better ways to do it. Uh, at the same time, also, I haven't changed the architecture of the underlying payments engine the entire time. It just worked perfectly first go, which everyone does. Um, but uh, it's, it, it's, it's much more solid, a much more solid foundation. And so, you know, you've kind of got two ways of doing that. Um, and I guess it's, yeah, uh, we still battle with this. Uh, this is kind of my point here. Take your time, do something right, and you'll get good results. Uh, shove something out the door, and you, you'll get terrible results, but maybe people will find that acceptable, and you just wasted a whole lot of time drawing a really nice thing when someone just wanted a really crap thing. So, um, But one of, the, one of the lessons we kind of learned after we were a little bit more established, um, and this kind of comes back to resourcing, is that products don't really compete it's not your product that's competing with other products in the industry or in, in, in your market. It's really the company. And the way that this was really proven to us is because when we built something that we knew was really good, we then went to sell it. And we were wondering why competitors with really crap software were doing much, much better than us. And a lot of it is, this is our sales team, right? They, they had very mature business processes. They had a lot of people going out there and talking to the industry, and they got a lot of people signed up and just using the product. And so harsh or hard lesson for us to learn is that, yes, it's, uh, it's not just our software's better. It's, oh, no, we don't have great onboarding or support or you know, the sales teams going out there and talking to everyone. So I would highly recommend, um, and this is actually a good point as well. I might skip to the next slide just so that it's not flashing at you. Um, as devs, we didn't really want to talk to people uh, all that much, I guess. <laughs> like, we didn't really want to go sell it. I, I, I'm okay at saying, like, this is what we do, and hey, you should really sign up, and this is the benefits, and all that kind of stuff. But in all honesty, I hate talking on the phone, and so I just don't want to do that. And the second that we hired someone to be on the phones all the time, talking to people, and just gaining feedback and making network connections, like, the company is just a completely different thing. Um, so I highly recommend if you're you know, only developers doing something, yeah, get someone who's uh, comfortable with just hammering the phones all day. Um, or alternatively, find someone who's in an industry who is non-technical and uh, try and pair up with them to go solve a problem. I think that's a really good way of doing it too. Um, so I kind of mentioned this before, but uh, one of the tricks we use to get people to kind of sign up and have a look at our stuff is uh, sending out surveys. So before we'd even tell them about our product, we would put together a survey that had asked some leading questions about kind of the feature set that we had built. So it's like, do you have problems with cash flow or something like that? This is just an example for me. But like, do you have problems with cash flow? And they can go, yes or no. Like, um, do you want something automated? Like, do you accept credit cards currently? Do you want to accept credit cards? And we would just do it as like a set of questions, kind of leading questions to say, well, hey, you answered yes to a bunch of those, so. Here's our thing. Um, and it turns out surveys, people really did actually fill them out a lot more than I thought they would. I thought this would be really annoying and spammy, but it turns out we got the most engagement and even just phone calls saying like, hey, I saw your email. Uh, the questions you asked were really interesting. Like, what is it that you do? So fun little tip. If you've built a thing, try sending out surveys. Um, the next thing we kind of did was build alongside the customers, which really helped. So those. Uh, accountants and stuff like that, we actually, we would build the thing, test it out with them, ask them what they wanted, and built for them, rather than my original problem of just building what I wanted and then trying to shove it at people's faces. So, um, yeah, receive feedback. Uh, and always be selling. Um, I used to, annoyingly probably, 
Every time I went to a restaurant or something like that, I'd ask them how they took their payments. I, I didn't really do in-person payments, but I was always just curious to know what they were doing. And I did usually prompt the question, oh, why, why do you want to know? Well, I have a thing, I, I do payments. And so it kind of helps open up a bit of uh, networking as well. But again, depends how comfortable you are with that kind of stuff. Um, I also want to kind of assuage any fears around making mistakes, because if there have been mistakes to make, boy, howdy, have I made them. Um, I've got some great examples. So um, we have, accidentally, you can surcharge fees with our product. So if the credit card's like 1.5%, you can say, hey, customer, you pay the 1.5%. And we accidentally had an invoice that was repeating month on month. And before I had really properly tested that surcharging thing, it did 1.5, then it did 1.5 on 1.5, then it did 1.5 on 1.5, and it kept going until the amount was about 10 times the original of the invoice they were supposed to be paying. So, whoops, refund it. Sorry about that. Um, we have had duplicate payments. So here's an invoice. Oh, that's now seven invoices, but I'll happily pay them all. And so seven times too much. Whoops, sorry, refunded. Um, and We've also had days where we forgot to send, this is the archaic side of things, we forgot to send the, the text file to the bank that says, here's all the transactions. Yeah, a few days later, people were like, hey, why haven't I, why haven't I been paid? I, uh, and that was, the whole, that was the whole system's worth of payments. So uh, yes, it can be rough and you will make mistakes. But the, the, the fantastic thing about this is that if you fix the mistakes, uh, and I think this is probably the relief one. I'll sit on relief. If you fix the mistakes, uh, that's typically all that people want, really. Like, you could, you could mess up pretty bad, but if you own it, fix the mistake, work out how you're going to try and not do that again, because honestly, we do keep making mistakes. It's going to happen. It's a very complex thing, um, software. And so the, the key takeaway, I guess, from all this is it's not so much what you've done, it's how you make them feel afterwards. And if you make them feel supported and you make them feel like they can always talk to you if need be, um, you could have people screaming at you down the phone, but the second you've fixed it, they go, ah, okay, great, thank you. Bang, done, sorted. Um, so if you do have any fears around, you know, oh, this is my software now, I'm accountable, I'm responsible, oh, that's a bit scary. Uh, know that you probably will make a mistake and know that it'll probably be okay. And that's good. That's a good thing. As long as you're not making like pacemakers or something like that. But that's why I don't make pacemakers. So speaking of feelings as well, um, this is one of the points I kind of wanted to address is the kind of ups and downs of this kind of journey, path, I guess, doing startup-y stuff. It, it's, it can be quite rough. It can be pretty great and then it can be pretty bad pretty quickly. Um, and I wanted to give a couple examples. So the uh, first ZeroCon conference um, that we went to, we had a tiny little booth, and I had the great idea of wearing a big fat lobster hat on my head. And I thought, yeah, it'll help us stand out. Uh, and it turned out to be this amazing thing. We had people coming up to us all day, and they were like, that's so cool. I can't believe you've done that, and asked us about our product and stuff like that. And I was like, yay, this is great. I'm going to get so many sign-ups from this. No, people just wanted to see me because I had a hat on. <laughs> um, I ended up winning a pitch conference at QuickBooks, like a QuickBooks event, which was really fun. I was like, yay, I'm super pumped. We managed to talk to the uh, person who is, uh, I guess, related to us in charge of QuickBooks. Um, and they were like, great, we're going to get you into the product. You know, we're going to start pushing uh, people to use Pinch in like certain demographics and stuff like that. I thought, yay, that's fantastic. This is gonna be revolutionary to our business. You can see that it was not. <laughs> um, and lastly, um, we ended up making a deal with a major like ASX listed company. And this was like our first enterprise deal. You know, the suits were on, we were in the boardroom looking at negotiations and stuff like that. Uh, and they agreed to also embed us into their product, and I thought, fantastic, this is also going to mean a lot of transactions. Now, the problem with all of these was that uh, nothing came of anything. So the, uh, the ZeroCon was great, but no one really signed up. We didn't really get any benefits, and we spent a bit of money on it. So that was like, ah, that was crap. That was a learning experience. The QuickBooks one, we actually did get put into a pilot program, and we beat PayPal, but... <laughs> Nothing came from it. They thought, didn't move the needle, 
not going to bother, sorry. Boosh, out the door. Um, and then the ASX listed company one, I'm still dealing with. It's a massive pain in the butt, but it uh, didn't really lead anywhere as well. So there were all these like really exciting times and nothing really came from it. And so that was actually pretty tough. And especially about two years in, um, thereabouts, I, I kind of really slumped into this like negativity uh, kind of spiral because I was working so hard on trying to get this right and, and good for customers. And we, we had enough traction that it was kind of like, it was all right, it was getting somewhere, but we were really growing really slowly. And I kind of, I don't know how it happened really, but one day I just kind of went, look, we need to stop doing everything. We need to just no more code until we've got plans and documents and, and it's gonna pr be proven that it'll work. And I was like that for maybe three months uh, really negative, any suggestions, like, no, got to be planned. Um, and thankfully, kind of eventually, my co-founder kind of like helped me out a bit and, you know, kind of pulled me up and said, look, it's, we're not doing too badly. It's not the end of the world. You know, we're going to get through this. And eventually, I kind of had to have a bit of a mindset, mindset shift to say, look, okay, you're right. We're not doing too bad. We probably will still keep growing modestly, but like, it's not the end of the world. Things take time. I'm going to keep going. And so... That really helped, and I guess kind of one of the points here is that um, having a co-founder is really helpful um, because you can kind of, uh, yeah, bounce ideas off them, help each other out. It's kind of, it's, it's a, it really is a relationship, actually, uh, more than anything. It's like second wife for me, I guess. But <laughs> um, they can help you kind of reappraise, and and that's kind of one of the one of the key things I wanted to talk about here. By the way, my wife is a. Um, a psychology researcher at Unimelp, and so that's why I do have a couple of legit, not just Ben waffling on about dev, but legit uh, emotion tackling strategies. Uh, and one of them is, well, the key one is don't ruminate. So don't just keep thinking about the negative things over and over and over, especially if you can't change them. Uh, and one handy tip to kind of get around this is to try and reappraise the situation. So if you, I don't know, if you got wet on the way to work um, because it rained and you forgot your raincoat or something like that. You can go, well, okay, well, at least, you know, you know at least I didn't get hit by a car or something like that. This is a pretty terrible reappraisal, but like, you know, look at, look at the bright side of life is kind of the, the thing to think about here. Um, and, you know, well, at least I got a bit of exercise and I haven't done that in a week, you know, so it was good to get outside. I feel a bit better about that. Um, so don't ruminate, try and reappraise. Uh, if something negative has happened and you can't change the situation, try distraction. Netflix, something like that. You know, it's legit a good idea to just take your, take your mind off things. Um, but reappraisal really is the key one there. Um, the next thing to do, and this really helped me get out of the slump as well, is to compare yourself to yourself. This is kind of what really helped because at the time I was being really negative, we had actually grown by like, we doubled in size since the previous year. And I thought back to that point in time I was like, oh yeah, we really have come a long way. We've really built a couple of cool features. We've really progressed. Um, and I wasn't, I was too busy looking at other companies doing really well. And I'm like, well, no, it's my own race. I've come really far. And this is really helpful. It's not, not even just startup-y things, but like even just in your whole life, don't compare yourself to other people around you and what their careers are doing and that kind of stuff. Compare where you are to where you were a year ago. And typically you'll find you've, you've probably done pretty well or you've grown or you've learned new things or something like that. Um, so it's a good idea to compare yourself to yourself um, because everyone's got, yeah, different starting points, different roads. It's that whole life context thing again. Um, and one quick example about this is that was a, this is about three years in, I had a person come to me saying, hey, Ben, I'm starting a, it's like a beer keg marketplace or something like that. I can't remember what it was. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that sounds like a pretty cool idea. I can kind of help you with the payments. He's like, great. I'm gonna go do that. And he ended up raising investment in two months. He ended up building the company to a profit profitability pretty quick. And then he ended up um, selling the company within you know, a year and a half or something like that. And I remember just watching him just blitz by in like progression going, wow, that was quick. Um, but he had worked for many other companies. He had done a lot of work at Uber. He had seen starting and scaling and moving on a lot. And so his race was very quick and I'm running mine. So compare yourself to yourself and don't be jealous. <laughs> I'm a little jealous. Uh, <laughs> uh, and lastly, kind of um, uh, because of the COVID kind of situation, uh, I've been working remotely now since 2014, I guess. Um, and so 
I just wanted to remind everyone to maybe if you're working remotely or you're working with people who are working remotely is to just kind of make sure to catch up on people um, and see how they're doing. Uh, it's, it can get isolating um, and you may not notice it if you've got social support and they don't. Um, so just a quick heads up. Say hi to the people that are working remotely. <laughs> um, yeah, I still don't like working remotely. <laughs> I prefer the office life, but that's just me. I've done it for too long. Um, so, oh, one thing I did forget to, forget to mention is it's okay to feel bad. Um, just accept that you're gonna feel bad sometimes and don't get upset that you're upset. <laughs> um, don't ruminate on it, but it's okay, totally okay to feel bad. You will feel bad. Check in with people and compare yourself to yourself. So let's grow this company, right? We're, we're now trucking along. We're three, three, four years into this, and we want growth. Um, and one of the tidbits, I guess, if we're talking about like marketing and selling things, um, one of the great books that I haven't read is called The Purple Cow. And it's just all about standing out. It's saying, be remarkable. Because no one looks at a brown cow and goes, hey, a brown cow. But everyone would go, hey, a purple cow? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> What's going on here? Um, and so the idea is stand out. This is kind of where my lobster hat idea came from. Um, and I think, it's still, I think it still works. It's the reason I use Ben Who Likes Beer when I'm introducing myself to people as well, rather than my actual name. Like legit, if I'm just walking up to people, I'm like, hi, I'm Ben Who Likes Beer. They're always like, huh, what? That's weird. No one does that. Um, and if you're confident enough, you can pull it off. Um, but it's remarkable, right? People will remember you. And it actually really helped me be remembered by people around the place, especially in situations like this where you're meeting hundreds of people. Um, can really help. But what I wanted to do is really distill the entirety of my knowledge and skill and abilities in the marketing kind of space. And, and, and I really want you to take this on board because... I don't know anything about marketing. <laughs> we've, uh, we've done not very well at this pretty much the whole time. A lot of our stuff has come from marketplaces, word of mouth. A lot of, the, a lot of it's come to us. And the caveat to the purple cow thing, I think, is stand out but fit in. Um, some of the feedback we had earlier on is like, we're a finance company, right? And I had all sorts of bold colors and lobsters and stuff floating around. Uh, the slide at the beginning, you could see the cityscape and stuff like that. Um, fun for some people. A lot of people are like, oh no, that's not serious. I'm not, I'm not touching that with you know, my fan financial products. Um, and so we ended up rebranding to something a lot more modest. Still a bit of excitement, but like a lot more modest. And we actually did see a legitimate uptick in business from that change. So stand out, be remarkable, fit in. Don't break expectations of your industry, I guess. Uh, I'm still new to that stuff. I'm learning. But uh, I think that was a handy lesson that we've learned recently. So it might be good to pass on. Um, People seem to like written content. Maybe write some more stuff. Uh, we're terrible at blog posting and stuff like that, but it does seem to work in the few times that we've done it. Um, and I guess the one thing that has worked for us is we're really obsessed with like customers being happy. Uh, and I think that helps with the word of mouth growth and that kind of stuff as well. So take care of people. They'll typically take care of you. Um, this is all just guidelines. Honestly, not very good at this side of the business. So take that as you will. Um, but the one thing I did really like was finding communities. And that's not only just dev communities like this, um, which you're already now a part of, but we you know, met up with accounting style uh, communities and small business communities. And all, uh, there's, there's lots of these little communities you can get into and network in where um, legitimately a lot of potential and opportunity comes from just meeting new people. Uh, it's kind of coming back to my it's all about people slides. Meet new people and you, you just don't know what you can do because you, you've got to really meet people to find out. Okay, we've got five minutes. So I do want to just whip through kind of the, the money raising experience as well. Um, this might be handy for some of you at some point. Um, I'm guessing, is anyone here looking to raise money as a, as a concept one? Okay, it's worth it then. <laughs> so some quick tips about raising money um, and Again, it's kind of different for everyone. Uh, traction is really important. If you do nothing else other than have customers, be it in any f way, shape, or form, that is the number one thing that's going to help because it proves a few things that it, it can work. People will pay for it. They'll pay what you're asking for it. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a lot of customers. It just has to be some. Um, and getting any r reviews and feedback from that can be really helpful as well. Um, think about how much money you're going to raise and where you're going to spend it. This was harder when we first started. We ended up raising 720K. 
and we were going to spend it on marketing, sales, and then building out some more and a little bit of development and paying ourselves as well. I hadn't been paid to that point. Um, and that worked to a degree. Um, we were lucky enough that we got enough customers such that we didn't run out of money. Uh, we've been very careful with our spending. So that's kind of how we did that. But like figuring out how much money you're going to need to get this thing done uh, is really important. And yeah, just where are you going to spend it? Because that's really what they want to know is, can you do it? Can I afford it? And where is all that money going? Um, one thing that is super helpful is uh, a cash flow spreadsheet. This is an abridged version. This is just a, um, yeah, basically a summary. But it's a good idea to have your total revenue coming in the door, how are you making your money and what's it going to add up to? You know, if, if you've got 50 customers paying you $100 a month, you know, there you go, $5,000, that sits in your revenue thing. Um, I like tracking growth over time. Um, your total COGS is cost of goods sold, so it's how much does it cost you to do the thing. For SaaS software, it's not that much, um, or if anything. Um, rebates, for us, we have partners that we pay out. Gross profit is the amount of money we're earning after we've spent everything. Uh, total overheads is the amount of money we're spending on things like salaries and any other expenses that we have as a company, lawyers, accountants, yada, yada. Um, your net profit is your gross profit minus your overheads. So you can see our net profit was negative for the longest time until, hooray, November 21. Um, and then running balance is just the cash that we had on hand in the bank at that point in time. Now for us, this cash, and then the runway is, uh, if you were expending at that net profit every month, how many months have you got until you ran out of money? It's a good idea to keep that above, well for us the guideline was 18, um, but it can be as low as probably 12. I really am not comfortable with going lower than that, um, but it obviously depends on your business. But having this spreadsheet and explaining how your business works is super handy. Um, there is an example of attracting investment. This is just more, I wanted to give an example of business models that you could push, uh, you could put out, but I think I'll skip that for now instead. And I'll just talk about the fact that there are pitch deck presentations that um, there's like templates and stuff like that you can do. Uh, but the, the, the key thing is you kind of want to know what problem you're solving, um, how you're solving it, how much do you want to raise. Um, I do, I probably can give you a look at my pitch deck. If anyone wants to come up and have a quick squiz at it, uh, after I'm done, um, feel free. I'll come and show you the actual, actual pitch deck. I think that'll be more useful. Um, but there are templates out there, and just the basics will do. You don't need to go overboard, that's for sure. Um, and I kind of wanted to finish with kind of why would I be talking about this, and why would I be talking about it to developers? And I think the, th the key message I want to push home here is that you really have the advantage um, over every other industry, over every other like uh, profession, because for us, you know, a few weekends of tinkering on a piece of software doesn't really cost us anything. Uh, we can spend the time, spare time even, going out and trying out different things. But for a non-technical person or a person in an industry who's like, hey, I've got this great idea and I just want to try out the bare minimum, it's, it's really difficult and it's really costly for them to do so. And so you've got this massive leg up on everyone else that where you can go out and just build things um, and potentially start businesses, especially if you partner with these people. Um, but I just wanted to kind of encourage you because, yeah, <laughs> it should be so much easier for you, um, or at the very least, you could just give it a go with very little downside. I think it's probably the main reason or the main thing to take away from that. And so I want to just reiterate Build some relationships. We're, we're at a conference. We're going to have a party tonight. Go talk to some people. Figure out what's going on uh, in everyone else's industry. Um, you never know what kind of synergies you might have with people um, and whether or not you might want to explore things. Uh, and just remember that your path to starting a startup is going to be completely different to everyone else's. So walk your own path. And with that, thank you very much. Now, I did just want to quickly mention as well <laughs> that we're hiring pretty much like everyone else out there, except I don't have to pay for one of those things out there. So, hey, if you are at any stage of your uh, development journey and you'd like to get some first-hand experience, perhaps with a startup company, um, we're hiring in this market as well. It's not really all that scary to just, you know, maybe quit try a new job for a little while, and then quit that if you don't enjoy it. So moving on is not too difficult. So if you would like to uh, come work with us, 
Um, I'll be around tomorrow night at the after party, um, which I'm putting on just at the General Assembly downstairs out the front here. So after everything is said and done um, in NDC, I'm heading down there. So if you do want to ha come have a chat, I will head down the back, I think, yeah, um, over time now. So I'll head down the back to take questions uh, if anyone has any. Um, otherwise, I hope to see you here. But yeah, let me know. Cheers, guys.